I think everyone who uses Linux at this point is well aware that Vim is basically a religion. Everything that can have Vim keys added into it will have Vim keys added into it, and your image viewer is absolutely no different. So today we're looking at an application called Vim IV. Basically take SXIV, take Ranger, smash them together, and then add some extra Vim bindings for good measure. I think it's a pretty cool application. Let's see what you guys think. Like with Ranger, it is written in Python, but I haven't found that to be much of a problem. If you do try this out for yourself, it won't look like this. This is a theme, we'll get to that later. The important thing for now is what it can actually do. So as you would expect, you can go up and down with your J and K keys. We can go into any of the folders in here, like let's say my pictures folder by pressing the L key and we can go out of the folder by pressing the H key. Sometimes the first time you open up a folder, it will take a little bit of time to actually cache it, but once it's been cached, it's perfectly fine. And if you go and press L on any of the images here, it will then go and open up that image. And then selecting the next image is as simple as going down to the next one and then pressing L on that one. Now do keep in mind that both those images were quite large. If we go to a really small one, like let's say this one here, which is only 500 kilobytes, it's basically instant. You can't see it because of my webcam, but in the bottom right hand corner, it says we are in library mode. So if we go and press L on this image again, it gets rid of our tab on the left hand side and now we are in image mode. So if you want to ever get back to library mode, all you need to do is press TL to toggle it, or you can press GL to go to the library. As this is a GUI application, there is some mouse support here and there. It's not complete because you are intended to be using your Vim keys instead. So we can do things like say click on an image and that will then go and select it. Double clicking it will actually close our library and take us into image mode. But we can't actually go and scroll through this, which is a really weird thing to neglect. The typical Vim keys you'd expect to see are here as well. So we can go and do a slash and then we can start typing something. Let's say ST. And as we actually type stuff, it will narrow down the things it's actually matching on. So let's go and search for ST. And there is one little problem with the default binding. So pressing N takes you to the next image in the library, but also the next thing in your search as well. So it's not exactly working the way it should. Pressing shift N though, will actually cycle through the things that are there. That N binding should work if you do remove it from the other functionality. You can also press question mark to do search in the other direction, but because you're doing stuff with shift N, they're effectively swapped anyway. Now, if we want to go and copy a path, pressing Y isn't going to be enough because what it's going to want you to do is press some other key after that to do things like copy the name or copy the absolute path. So let's go and press YA. And if I go to my terminal now, as we can see, that right there is the path to the image. X will let you delete an image. So say this one right here. And it doesn't actually prompt you for deletion. So just do keep that in mind. Pressing Q will quit the application, but there is also a command mode that we will get into a bit later. And there is a quick command in here, which is shortcutted to just doing colon Q. Now, all of the different modes actually have their own key bindings. And if you'd like to check those bindings, we can go and run the key bindings command. There is going to be tab completion as well, which is absolutely lovely to see. And this key binding screen is actually generated from the config. So any key bindings you add in here yourself will actually be listed here. So this key binding screen also has a search. So we can go and search for things like, say, any of the library commands. So enter library, set library width, toggle library. Honestly, this might be one of the best key binding screens I've ever seen. Let's check out what image mode can actually do. So pressing L to get back to the image and then pressing N on an image will actually take you to the next one and P will take you to the previous one. Now, the reason why it's not J and K or H and L is because these keys will be used for something else. And that something else is for moving around the image. So let's go and zoom in by just pressing plus. We can zoom out by pressing minus. So let's go and press plus again, and we can actually scroll around the screen with our Vim keys. So obviously J, K, L, and H. And if we want to go and scroll to the edge of an image, we can go and use the capital versions of those as well. So capital H will go as far left as we can go. Capital L will go as far right. Capital K will go as far up and capital J will go as far down. Now I do appreciate the way that image flipping is done. So if we go and press the bar character, that is going to do a horizontal flip 
And if we do an underscore, that is going to do a vertical flip. Now, I've never seen another application that actually does this, but it's definitely grown on me, and I'll probably have to rebind other applications to do the exact same thing. If we don't want to mess with zooming ourselves, we can go and let the application scale stuff for us. So pressing capital W will reset the zoom to 100%. Pressing W will just do a fit. That will try to fit the height and the width inside of the image. If we go and press capital E, that is just going to try to fit the height. And if we press lowercase e, that is just going to try to fit the width. And let's go to a GIF for a second. So GL takes us back to the library. And let's play this one right here. So if we're in image mode and we press space, that will let us actually go and pause the GIF. And then obviously pressing space again, we'll start playing it. Now, rather than just seeing the images one by one, if you go and press TT for toggle thumbnail, it will take us into a thumbnail mode. And obviously GT will go into thumbnail mode from any other mode. While you're in thumbnail mode, even though you may have your library enabled, if you try to move around, you'll actually be moving around inside of the thumbnails rather than inside of the left-hand column. So just do keep that in mind. Say if you're at this point right here and you try to press down and realize it's not actually working. But this acts as basically a library anyway. So let's go and press TL to get rid of the library. And then we can go and say select this image right here and then that GIF will start playing. If we go and press TT again, it'll take us back to the thumbnails. We can go to another one so on and so forth. Now there is one more mode we can use and that mode is manipulate mode. Either GM or TM will take us into it, but those bindings can't actually be used to escape it. The only way to escape it is to confirm the changes or to cancel them. So let's go and press TM. And as we can see, we can control things like the brightness, the contrast, the hue, saturation, and lightness. So let's make some changes to this image. So if we go and use the L and the H keys, that is going to modify our brightness. We can also move this with our mouse as well. So either one works, whatever you're more comfortable with. I'm just going to use my Vim keys. Let's increase the brightness. And if we want to go to the next bar, we can press the N key. That'll take us now to the contrast. Let's increase this massively as well. And as we can see in the bottom right hand corner, as we actually modify stuff, once the value settles, it'll actually show us a new preview. So let's go to the hue, saturation, and brightness by pressing the tab key. And then once again, N will take us to the next one and P will take us to the previous one. Let's go and increase the saturation by, I don't know, this much. And then let's go back to the hue and lower this to, let's say, I don't know, negative 45. And that is the image that we are left with. If you would like to save these changes, you can press enter. And then those changes will actually be made to the image. If you don't want to save them, make sure that you press escape because it will not make a backup for you. Now onto that command mode for a bit. It's set up basically the same way it's set up inside of Vim. But when you go and press colon, it shows you every single command you can run and a description of that command. Now, this isn't actually all of the commands. This can be scrolled through. I'm not sure how many there are. There's not a ton, but there's everything you need here in an image viewer. And then if we go and start typing something, as I mentioned earlier, we can go and do tab completion, which is such a lovely option. Pressing shift tab will go in the other direction as well. And if it's a command that takes a second argument, so for example, like the help command, it will actually go and list out the things you can have alongside help. It doesn't do this for everything, which does indicate to me that this list is actually manually made, because if we go and run the enter command, which is the command you can actually use to switch modes, it doesn't actually list out the modes we can go to. But if I go and pass in library here, it will actually go into library modes. I would like to see it consistently tab complete, but it's still a really cool functionality. So that's pretty much all for the application. One thing I didn't mention earlier is things like say GG and capital G do actually work. And you can actually go and use these numbers along the side. So if we go and run the go to command and then say pass in the number 22, that'll jump us directly to line 22. I would like to be able to do something like say G and then 12 and then it'll automatically go there, but it's still better than nothing. Now, as for the configuration, it's actually split across two separate files. So those files are going to be located inside of your .config folder as they should be on a Linux system and they'll be in a folder called vimiv. 
And then inside of that folder, we're going to have three different things in here. We're going to have the vimiv.conf, keys.conf, and then styles. I'll get to the styles in just a moment, but keys.conf is where all your key bindings are going to be set and every single binding in the application can be changed. So even though it has these vim style bindings, it doesn't have to. If you want to bind it like Emacs, you're completely free to do so. So the way this works is it's going to be split up into a couple of sections. So right here we have the global section. This is going to be bindings that work in every single one of the modes. Then we have the image section, the library section, the thumbnail section, the command section, and the manipulate section. So basically any of the commands under any of these headings are only going to work inside of that mode. And then on the left hand side of any binding we have the actual key you're going to be pressing. So for example, control B, control F, button right, that is button right on your mouse, or pressing capital E, anything like that. Then we have a space and a colon followed by another space, and then what you see on the right hand side is just any of the commands you can actually write inside of command mode. So they're not any Anything special, anything you can run inside of the application can also be put inside of the config. One such binding that's missing is a key to actually see the key binding. So I actually went and added that in my config. If I go and press that key now, it'll actually bring up that menu. If there's anything you want to make sure doesn't have a binding, you can instead go and add the NOP function to it. So that basically means no operation. You can run no op inside of the application. It just doesn't actually do anything, so it's not even in the autofill menu. All of these functions are documented on the GitHub page, so I'll leave a link to that one down below in the description if you'd like to check it out for yourself. Now, as for the other config file, that is going to let you set the general settings for the application. So whether you want to have your files be shuffled, what theme you want to use, how long you want your command history to be, whether you want to use fuzzy completion. Now, this one does have sections as well. And I would highly, highly suggest actually looking at the documentation for these ones because if you don't have it in the correct section, it just won't function whatsoever. I think the way they've actually set up the commands is a little bit confusing. So in the documentation, we have things like, say, the command dot history underscore limit. But just writing this inside of the config file isn't going to work. So if we go back to that one, as we can see, we have the history limit here, and it's actually in the command section. So anything before the dot, that is going to be the section header. And then anything after the dot is going to be the name of the thing you can set. As with the commands we can run, most of the configuration options are fairly well documented as well. So if we go back to that one, they all have fairly decent descriptions here. The one thing that is missing though, is a description of the value you actually pass into that setting. So for example, for library.show underscore hidden, it shows you what it actually does, but it doesn't tell you that what it takes is a Boolean value. Now, it is fairly obvious that it is going to be Boolean, but is it going to be true or false? Is it going to be zero or one? Is it going to be true and false in capitals or lowercase? That does need to be described in here. Or the status bar section is actually much, much worse, where it doesn't actually describe what any of these elements actually mean. It's not like you need to change it, but if you're going to have this be configurable, it should also be documented so people can actually configure it. Now, as for the actual theme, let's go and switch it back to the default theme, just so you can see how it looks out of the box. Let's go and quit out of the application, and vim iv. Yeah, as you can see, it looks a little bit horrendous. So... I'm currently running the Material Darker theme, and you might be thinking, oh, some small application like this isn't going to have that many themes. That is where you would be wrong. So what the developer decided to do is take all of the base 16 themes and then convert them over to themes to be used with Vim IV. So we basically have hundreds of themes to work with. So you can scroll through this and see everything that is available. Personally, I like Material Darker, but things like Grovebox are here as well, or you can use the Dracula theme or anything else you want that's available. Or you could just go and make your own. Now, as I typically suggest, I would recommend going and downloading one of the themes and then modifying it to actually fit what you want it to fit. So if we go and look at this, as we can see, there are these 16 colors here, and we can also go and modify things like the font. So I was actually running my JetBrains mono font because I think that's the best looking font. We can also modify things like the thumbnail padding and the default one actually shows some extra options as well. So you can modify 
the colors of different elements, and all of this other stuff as well. I have noticed that this part doesn't actually seem to be anywhere in the documentation. So for these things, take it from the default theme, modify it, and then see what actually changes. One thing I do want to mention is Vim IV is a QT5 application. There did used to be a GTK version, but that version isn't really being maintained anymore, and the QT version is the main version. So if you don't like QT applications, well, you can't exactly run this. If you would like to install it on Arch, there is an AUR package. If you're on Fedora, you can use DNF. If you are anyone else, you can use PIP. And if you really want to, you could go and manually install it as well. But I don't really see any reason to do that. I think that's going to be everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chico, Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Pity, Stephen, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, there'll be links down below to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and other things that you can go and click. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere, and then this channel is available on Odyssey and BitChute if you'd like to watch my content on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.